Hi, I'm Jimmy. So this is an investing discussion that I did with the guys from the Everything Money YouTube channel. This is a bit more casual than the types of videos I typically do on this channel, but we thought it would be interesting to sit around and talk about how we look at investing. Now we do have different video styles and our processes are a bit different, but our core beliefs around investing are very similar. So if you haven't done so yet, please click on the link in the description below to their channel, to their videos, check them out, subscribe, let them know I sent you. Okay, now let's jump into the investing discussion. Jimmy is here. Jimmy from Learn to Invest. Welcome in. Jimmy drove all the way here. Uh, we exchanged emails months ago, Tim, and we got Jimmy in. Uh, you were kind enough to accept our request, and we thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Hi, I'm Jimmy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy came in. He went to golf, and it started raining today. Yeah, yeah. There were big plans. If you're not a <laughs> follower of Jimmy and, and Learn to Invest, uh, he's a value investor like us. Uh, he is very analytical, incredibly intelligent, as we know. And uh, your dad was in this game years ago. And yep. so we wanted to sit down. And how many subscribers do you have now? 225,000. Yeah, something like they that. They have a big channel. Yeah, three yeah. times ours. That, that's, that's great to hear. Um, Jimmy will be launching a, a Patreon in the very near future. And obviously, toward the end of the video, we'll describe where we're going with our community. But in general, um, our fans were definitely asking, like, to do this. They wanted to hear the two of you talk. Uh, Paul is very much a mindset teacher. When, when it comes down to numbers, he has been teaching me for the past three years. I've had a front row seat of learning from you, Paul, about how to invest, how to be disciplined. And really, I have this little um, Paul on my shoulder when I think I want to make like poor investing decisions. But Jimmy, talk, Paul will definitely chime in. But talk about your path to becoming a value investor and why it speaks to you? Yeah. So uh, my first job out of college was as a, as a day trader. And I, I never really took to that all that much. I found it very, it, it was, it was really, it didn't just, it didn't suit my personality. You know, Mo, I know is a good trader and I just couldn't do it. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't focus. I couldn't, it was, it didn't make any sense to me. But even leading up to that, the, my father had always worked on, well, he had worked on, he started working on Wall Street when I was actually in high school. He was, he was actually a construction worker up in Boston, and then he got hurt. He lost a finger. Oh. Yeah. And uh, he lost a finger, and then he started learning about, hey, you know, how do I, how do I better my life? And in doing that, he came up with this idea, hey, what if I went to Wall Street, which was crazy. He didn't graduate high school. He, oh. you know, he, he wasn't really the go-to-Wall Street type, but sure enough, he did it. He went and he took the Series 7 test and he you know, got a job here. We were actually still in Boston when you know, uh, I, was, I was in eighth grade at that time. And then I moved to New Jersey for my freshman year of college. I mean, freshman year of high school. And then, so I had my father teaching me some stuff back then. But then the real pivot point for me when I really started to uh, get deeper is when I was in college, I actually got hurt and I uh, ended up, you know, it was a, it was, it was a big thing. I, I ended up in a coma and I had trouble. Like when I came out of it, I couldn't read. I couldn't do a lot of things. I had trouble with memory. And how long was the coma? The coma was like a week. I think I don't remember any of it. I don't remember. There's like a gap of years yeah. and I don't remember any of it. But all I know is that I came out of that and then I start going to rehab and I try to start you doing, I'll, I'll do a more in-depth video about this whole story on my channel if you're curious. But basically, one of the things that came out of that is I couldn't really we read. And my father would come home from work and he would help me do, you know, he would basically sit down and read and he was reading investing books because he's trying to get better and he's trying to learn. So he would show me different things and we would talk about, you know, what this particular, you know, security analysis was one of the books we read. Not a good book to read, by the way. But <laughs> You say the same thing, right, Paul? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a very practical book for, for learning right now because of the way it's written. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's very, very dense. There's way better books. But it's really there. awesome to say I read that book. It is, yeah. So, but that was one <laughs> of the things that he was sort of coaching me through it and coming out of the injury where I was struggling with like memory and I was struggling with, you know, knowing different words and stuff. He was there to sort of help me rehab lasted for a few years and as those as during those years most of my learning was going back most of my rehabilitation was revolved around investing 
So by the time I got to the point where I was starting to, you know, I, w- I lived alone before, before I got hurt. And then when I got hurt, my parents had me come back in the house. By the time I went back on my own again, oh, I was, I was all in investing, you know, this is the path I want to go. And I had to go back to school and finish school because obviously reading is an important part of school. So my, you know, degree that should have been four years ended up being like eight or nine. Or so how did you get into value investing specifically as opposed to just becoming a money manager and following the market and just trying to keep your job? I would say the value investing side of it was more of a gradual thing. It is, it is something that I can logic out. I, I understand, you know, I own companies like Intel. I, I know why I bought it. I know why I bought it at the price I did. And a company like NVIDIA, which we looked at, I, it doesn't bother me. That stock could triple over the next three years and it doesn't bother me. Like I, I don't mind. So the value investing side of it was more of a gradual thing that I just sort of got there that I could do growth investing, but felt a bit more like gambling. And then, and it was funny, my first job on Wall Street happened to be right before the financial crisis. Oh, So I got in and then everything hit the fan and now, you know, I'm suddenly realizing, well, growth, you know, the, the guys coming out of that, the best were guys like Buffett, who at that time were getting offers for, you know, amazing deals, huge value opportunities, and he had the cash to do it. And I was like, oh, this is way more logical. Yep. So that's sort of how it's more been trial and error and learning different methods. And I've read books on how to be a good growth investor or how to be a trader. And I usually get to the end of it and be like, yeah, no. Oh, well, you say the same thing, right? Me. It just doesn't speak well, to I, No, it, it, growth, inv- you mean momentum investor? Uh, like growth, I think growth is an important part of value as I'm sure Jimmy agrees with. But for me, it's more of um, having the process that works for you that has been proven to show it works, right? And for me, the Philip Fisher aspect of value investing is saying, hey, listen, you can find a great company that's growing that has good that has good fundamentals as opposed to the original Warren Buffett cigar butts where he's just like, Oh, look, there's one puff left in this company. I think that's basically what Perkshire Hathaway was originally. It was a textile plant that he was just buying to get a few puffs out of it left. It's a combination of both. I'm much more on the Philip Fisher side of saying, okay, I want to find a company that even if it has reasonable growth levels, people are discounting it because it's not as sexy as something with very high growth levels. And to Jimmy's point, NVIDIA, we did NVIDIA today. Guys, we thought NVIDIA was massively overpriced. And Jimmy said it, and he's 100% right. It could go up 10 times tomorrow. And guess what I do? Eh, don't care, right? To me, I have the discipline of saying, I don't care. The average investor goes, how did I miss that? Well, you stick to a, if you have a process that works and you believe in, you'll never miss anything. You'll never miss anything that you regret. Exactly. And, and you're, the correction about growth versus momentum, you're right. I meant momentum investing. Yeah. The growth side of it, any value investor has to make assumptions about what growth will be, look at companies, but you could find a momentum stock that I think that's the interesting part, especially in today's market, is you can look at a a stock that is flying high, something like Tesla or Nvidia. And if you ever really look at the numbers, there's no way to justify the, the current price. You know, if it is Well, there's a way to justify it. The question is, are those justifications reasonable and probable? Like Kathy Wood says, if Tesla grows at 92% a year, this is a value stock. Sure. If Tesla's revenue grows at 92% a year, it's a $32 billion revenue company. 92% growth per year for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. That's a... What it's is obscene. that? Yeah, that's totally obscene. It's doubling every year for 10 years. Give me a break. So for our new investors out there, you know... uh, I had to learn from Paul this idea of discipline and sort of making disciplined decisions, which we're now doing, you know, with our with our diets and trying to get down on our weight. And I, I'm using sort of your teachings, Paul, like in all aspects of my life, like like buying half and half at a store or buying my stupid magic cards. But are you incredibly di- disciplined person where you're not going to fall victim to some of the more exciting plays that are out there? How, how did how did you get to this where you're at today? Disciplined. Yeah, I would say that I'm fairly disciplined. I mean, I try to be, you know, most of the time from an investing standpoint, I think it's much easier because I've seen it, you know, like I get, I like to get up early and I try to get up around five thirty. Oh, or so. Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll get up. But for me, frankly, at nine o'clock at night, like my brain checks out, like uh-huh. I've gone to edit videos at night and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm making too many mistakes. I'd rather just go to sleep now get up at five and I'll be 
you know, I wake up very fast. I don't, I don't drink coffee. Nine o'clock, my night is starting to go to, to like nine, 11, 30, 12 o'clock is basically when I'm going to bed. Yeah. yeah no. But I'll sleep till 7.30. Just be like, listen, I need my eight hours of sleep. For me, eight hours is important. So, and I'm a very big believer in that. It's just for I mean, I think yeah. Seth agrees with that. Yeah, for sure. So like, but how, how is your discipline transformed into like not buying? We get a ton of our, the people in our community, the Everything Money community or our Patreon. A lot of people say, I, I watched other videos on, of the YouTube experts. I got burned by buying, um, by being undisciplined and buying stocks that seem really fun. AMC and short squeezes and diamond hands. Paul, you have diamond hands. Uh, I do. And uh, Ape Nation and all this absurdity and so how why are your your viewers drawn to what you're giving them and how do, how do you keep them from staying away from that well i i think a lot of the i think a lot of the discipline you know comes from from being confident with the process i know you guys talk a lot about the process i think that you know my discipline in my personal life like i, I grew up playing hockey and I made it a point to practice by myself every day. And if we had a game, the game might be at night. After practice, I would go practice stick handling or skating or going backwards or whatever it was. I would practice every day. And I always wanted to do it because my thought process was that if somebody, if the guy I'm playing against is practicing three hours a day, then I should be doing it three and a half hours a day. And that's how you get better. And then I think that that sort of discipline, rolling that into investing, if you, if you legitimately go back and study the history of the stock market or just watch it for a really long time, and I've had the advantage now of watching it for a while and also studying the history of it, and it's, it becomes clearer that if you remain disciplined, you know, everybody's, everybody's, you know, all these YouTube guys are, are brilliant when the stock market's going up, but when things hit the fan, you know, I own a couple stocks, just a handful that I found in this, what I believe to be an overpriced market. If the stock market drops 30% tomorrow, I'm not selling a single one of them. And I'm trying to get cash to buy more. But that comes from, you know, knowing your process and knowing the, what you're looking for, and then don't violate those rules. You know, and that's, you know, for me, throughout my life, that's the things I've tried to, I've tried to get better at. You know, sometimes I'll get up, you know, going back to getting up early in the morning. I've done that even on vacation mm. just because I don't want to break the rhythm. I'll get up and read just because I, I refuse to throw my schedule off and mess up. I'm afraid that when I go back to work or when I leave vacation, whatever it is, I'm going to somehow mess up my discipline. So I much prefer, here's my process. Here's what I do. You know, we're just going to live with that. Yeah. We talked about our processes on the show. We looked at the stocks. You know, we use, Paul, we use our eight pillars to screen for stocks mm -hmm. and, and jimmy you go really deep into learning about the companies a lot sooner than we do is the point yeah um how how uh, how can uh, an investor m sort of marry these two ideas of an, an initial screener and then a deep dive like y y we've actually recorded with you and shown you our process which i think is probably surprising to you you know the, the, how, how quickly we can get a look at a company and, and either get interested or uninterested in it pretty quickly. So how can they marry the eight pillars and your, your steps moving forward about looking at the 10 K listening to conference calls, really getting after it? like, you know, do you think your viewers would be open to learning about this or incorporating the two? I think so. I think that they're, frankly, I think that the two processes are very complementary because they're simply looking at stocks in different points in time. I've watched videos where Paul, you're, you know, you'll analyze the stock and you'll, at the end of it, you'll say, okay, go, go do the research. The research process that I came up with for the video that I did on my channel assumes you identified the stock. Like I, I skipped the whole screening part mm -hmm. and I went, so, okay, here's a company you like. Question is, do we buy it? Is it a good company? And I, I think along those same lines, it's funny because in the video, I talk a lot about, okay, you're reading about the business right? You read the business section of the annual report. That's usually where I start with a company I know nothing about. That section of the annual report tends to be quite good as far as they break down the business. It's usually somewhat simple. If it's not simple, toss it, just See get ya. rid of it. But if it is simple and you like it and you read about it and say, hey, I can envision in 10 years, this is going to be a really good business, or this will continue to grow, or this will still be valid. You know, something like Coca-Cola, 
probably going to be here in 10 years. It's unlikely it's, you know, not going blockbuster, not so much. So I think that the, the thing that I focus on in my process is you're looking for a reason to eliminate the company. So you read the business and you're looking for, ah, this isn't any good, toss it. Because then you, as you screen for different companies, you might end up with, you might go through a hundred total companies. You screen and the screen kicks out 10 that look interesting. And then you go through the process that I have and that process, your, your goal is to kick them out. You should only end up with one or two after that. And, but the two that you end up with are good companies that you know are, by the time you get to the, through the entire process, you know their price good, you know where you want to buy them, you know why you want to buy them, you know what you expect of them in the future, you know what their competitors are doing. You know, it can be a very in-depth process if you want to. You know, you can always skim through it if you'd like. Maybe a question for both of you guys to answer is like, what pitfalls can new investors, we've seen a lot of new money come in, young people getting excited for this. Paul, we've, we've done videos about the pros and cons of this. It's nice to see young people saving. No one did this when we were younger, uh, including myself. And uh, so what, what can new investors learn from the two of you? Like what, what can we first avoid? Uh, the, the, if you have a process, you will avoid a lot of mistakes. You'll avoid a lot of big home runs that everybody else just guessed and got right. But guys, just like flipping a coin, if you flip a coin 10,000 times, you're going to get them, you're going to get a flip, you're going to get a flip um, heads seven times, eight times in a row, a couple, you know, at some point, does that make you a coin flipping expert? No. <laughs> You know, when, uh, that's what I'm always talking about when I'd say, when I go to like the, to play, when I used to play golf or when I hear people saying, yeah, my next door neighbor, he's a 16 year old kid. And he's talking about how Bitcoin's a great investment. Okay. That's a sign of the times, right? So to me, it's all about process. Jimmy said, we talk about process all the time. Find a process that speaks to you, that works for you. Don't copy it with somebody's process. Listen to a lot of people's process that speaks to you and you'll start pulling the things together that make sense. And the more confidence you have, the easier it is to do that. I can look at my good friend, Gary, who is interviewing the janitor's ex-wife's, you know, former landlord to figure out if the company is good or not. And I'm just like, nah, I'm not doing that. Why? I, I don't care to. I want to look at the numbers. I want to own 30 positions of good companies with stable cash flows. He's also buying much smaller companies than I am. I'm trying to buy, that's another thing different. I'm trying to buy five, 10 plus billion dollar companies at a decent price. I'm going to give up return for that, but I'll make it up in other ways. And that process works for me. Jimmy, what are you telling new new viewers to, to how to, how they can succeed and avoid? What should they be avoiding? You know, it's very similar to the way Paul explains that. I think that I think the, do the research when you first asked a question. My thought was you got to do the research. I think where people get burnt is they bought something because somebody said it somewhere. Yeah, and they don't really know what they own. You know, uh, I go back to a comment that somebody made in an Intel video that I had done in the past, and in that they said. Uh, the Mobileye, the division of Mobileye that they acquired, that's the future. We're going, that's why I bought the stock. And I remember being like, oh, I mean, I like the, I like the business. Mobileye is awesome, but it is so small right now. You know, have you ever stopped to look at what about the other signs of business? Because, you know, I personally like Intel, but if you didn't like the other lines of business and Mobileye, you're right. It's going to go gangbuster. The stock's probably still going to go down. The business is going to go down if you're not right about the whole business. So I'm a big fan of do the research. And I think the simplest way to do that is let's say somebody has a portfolio. They look at their portfolio and go stock by stock. Why do I own this stock? Can you explain to somebody in 30 seconds why you own it and what would make you get rid of it? You know, people often ask me, when, I, when do I want to sell a stock? And I'm like, well, hopefully never. Like I, ideally, I'd rather not get out of it. Alibaba is a stock that I own and I hope I never get out of it. But if China came over and said, we're delisting it, well, okay, I'm out of it. You know, okay, I know the trigger points that will get me out of this. If, you know, Intel, Intel is one of those I, I hope I own for a long time. But if they continue to, uh, you know, I think that they have the cash and the size to turn things around and create new products, new groundbreaking products com to compete with AMD, which I do, and even NVIDIA, which I do believe is a, you know, a superior product right now. The bet that I made is that, Intel can do it and they have the time and the capital to do they it. They have the capital, that's for sure. So if they said, hey, we're walking away from this whole chip business and we're going to focus over here. Okay, I'm out. Like I know why I own it. And if, you're, if that doesn't work out, then I'm gone. So I think that knowing why you own a stock is very important. The stock price, I don't think should be a part of that equation. You know, I, I own it here because it's cheaper because, 
you know, I don't want to sell it. You know, I've seen many people who buy a stock and then they're afraid to sell it when it goes down. And it's like, okay, why, why do you own it? Well, I thought it was going to go higher. Okay, well, I mean, that's not really an answer. <laughs> but, I, but I think a lot of investors get in there and then they, uh, many investors have the mindset that if I don't sell, it's not really a loss. And my thought process there is if you don't know why you own it, you're just throwing that money away. Like it, you might be right, it might go up and by all means. But frankly, if it goes up, that's worst case scenario because now you think you did it correctly. Now you think your process was correct and you've really had no process. Yeah, you guys mentioned this and Paul, we talk about this on the show all the time, but I think if you if you scan YouTube, the process of the two of you is, is far down the list of popularity. Yeah, that's why Sven, that's why that's fun. That's why Jimmy thought when we did a reaction video to him that it was going to be a bad reaction video yeah. because he's so used to everybody being saying, this guy's an idiot and we were not. Yeah, that was. Yeah, so it, it, we've talked about how this is sort of a lonelier path of only finding a few companies and then you come on our videos and it's a lot of don't buy this stock. Um, how do, yeah, Paul, how, how, how should people be thinking? I mean, you know, you find the, the competitors on YouTube. That if almost, you want to buy momentum, find a momentum process that works. Don't just find one that's like, oh, I like this company. No, there's great momentum ideas out there, including moving averages, including the complete turtle trader. Find a momentum process that works. If you don't, if value doesn't speak to you, I get it. Find momentum, find a process that works for momentum because there are great ways to make a lot of money in momentum trading. But if you try to confuse, in my opinion, mixing a business with momentum is, it's oil and water. I, I don't think they work together. There are a lot of successful traders who mix fundamentals with, with, chart, with trading. I don't get that. That doesn't speak to me. Find something that speaks to you. Jimmy, where's your channel going in the future here? You got a lot of uh, subscribers. Folks love you. A lot of our fans love you. That's why we had you on. So what are you foreseeing uh, for Learn to Invest in the next coming years? Well, we've been working on different ways to ramp up the amount of videos that we've been doing. Uh, I know we've talked about doing a Patreon. We're going to get that rolling soon and try to get more right. you know, exclusive content uh, for that type of thing. And I'm, what I'm, one thing that I'm trying to do is on a personal basis is refine my process to make it faster, you know, because uh, it was funny when we were at dinner last night, yeah. we were talking about uh, the research that I do for a stock. And I was telling everybody that, you know, I might spend, you know, seven or eight hours analyzing a company. And then I write down the notes that I want to talk about in the video. Then I shoot the video. And the, the tricky part about being a YouTuber and making YouTube videos is that sometimes I'll get into that. I'll get halfway through and I'm like, yeah, I don't like this stock. I don't like it, but I'm not, in, I'm not doing it for myself anymore. I'm doing it for yeah. an audience. So I've got to run that process down. And then I'm thinking, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm missing something. So, so I spend so much time going down the rabbit hole. Maybe it's more efficient to get to the better companies to do, yeah, sure, still make that video, but shorten that research process and even share, hey, I was doing the research. Here's where I got, here's what I was looking at. And at this point in time, I wanted to bail out. You know, so that's what we're doing right now. We're bailing out of that and we're moving over to this stock, whatever that is. So that's where I want to take the channel. I want to go to uh, more videos and uh, try to get, try to bring more high quality opportunities to the table and to sort of explain the process because I think that that process can be huge. So yeah, so that, that, that's ultimately the, the end game. Paul, we, um, we've wanted to sort of pave our own path uh, in terms of collaboration. You've been very hesitant. Why or was it, were you uh, full go on Jimmy? What, what, what pushed you? We watched his videos and realized this guy is a like-minded investor and he was, seemed very humble. And so we're like, okay, let's do this. Yeah, you're, you're, a little, uh, you're definitely, Paul, you're not as humble maybe as... I come across very um, uh, cocky. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's the uh, what's the term I'm thinking of? Jimmy, how often are you? I'm not going to say the term. Insulting, uh, <laughs> insulting your viewers. No, I'm kidding. What is the what is the term? I don't know. I don't okay. know. I, I blanked out when you went to describe. I try really hard not to invest our viewers. Uh, well, because frankly, I think that the the person who's buying Tesla at the very top, yes, is not. The one for you. No, it's not even that. It's not even, I don't even look at it as he's a fool. 
I look at it as he doesn't know better. Misinformed. Or she doesn't know better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a, oh my God, I heard about this. And if you look at the chart, you know, why people, I think people are inherently short-sighted. So they see it skyrocketing and the only logical move is to keep skyrocketing. I see that same thing skyrocketing and I'm thinking, ooh, this is, this is going Be to careful. drop. Yes, yeah. exactly. There's a problem coming yeah. just because you can't, it can't keep up forever. This is a hard mindset to switch over to is like uh, think, thinking your way. So, well, folks, if this resonates with you, uh, obviously, uh, we'd love for you to subscribe to both channels, Learn to Invest and Jimmy and his, his new Patreon coming out. You can join the Everything Money community and talk to our 6,000 Discord members that kind of talk all all like this. Yep. And so if you felt alone out there, especially your community, if you felt out alone, alone out there in your investing journey and you might be confused about sort of this high-end process, this is my job is sort of bring your questions to these guys. But if you feel lonely out there like I did, you know, join these communities and we assure you that both will provide a level of um, a confidence and um, process and yeah. process and going back real quick to the reason for the Patreon. I think one of the advantages that, that I haven't really taken advantage of as much as I, I should. One of the reasons I want to do the Patreon is for that interaction where you do a discord and we can all get together and talk Absolutely. And every yeah. day, jump in and, you know, spitball ideas. I, I would be, you know, foolish to think that my ideas are better than everybody else's. I always tell people, I'm like, guys, there's 6,000 investors in here. I'm not the best one. Exactly. There's no yeah, way I'm the best one. There's a million good ideas out there. Some of the best, even investing ideas I've gotten, I got, you know, when I bought Intel, I bought that from, from one of my friends who said it. Like there's, you're uh, welcome. You know, I, yeah, yeah. So I think that <laughs> that's one of the reasons I want to do it. I think that community, the interaction, listening to other people and then doing your own research yep. is the name of the game. That's our take. Uh, follow Jimmy and learn, learn to invest. Join his Patreon, join the Everything Money community and you can get our software and uh, hopefully we can do this again, Paul. This will be great. We will. Thanks for watching, guys. Follow the thumbs up on the way thanks, out. Thanks, Jimbo. And, uh, thanks, Jimmy. Thank I you, guys, it, for man. having me. Yep. See you around, man. Appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks, guys.